But first up, he is a Pulitzer Prize winning investigative journalist, writes for The New Yorker, whose new book is War on Peace, The End of Diplomacy and the Decline of American Influence. Ronan Farrow. <laughs> Great to see you. You've uh, pleasure to be back. You have had quite a year. I you, am you got very a, tired. Bill. You, you, I was, you got a Pulitzer Prize. Are you thirty yet? I am thirty. Just thirty. That's old in TV and years. Still got your. Oh fuck you! <laughs> uh, you got your first Pulitzer Prize. That's pretty great uh, for your uh, work in uh, the Harvey Weinstein stuff and the Me Too movement. And now you've got this book about a completely different subject, which is really well received by very serious people about foreign diplomacy. I noticed that uh, the president spoke to Congress and really echoed a lot of the thoughts in your book. Unfortunately, it was the president of France. <laughs> um, and well, but first of all, what do you think of this eight play that I was just talking about between him and the, what it was going on there? The, the, this power moves of yanking each uh, other, dusting the, dusting the imaginary the, uh, dandruff off the shoulder. I mean, this is not diplomacy. And you have Macron get up before Congress and talk about. Voltaire and Ben Franklin right. in the 1700s, and everyone's like, yes, please, more of this. We want professional international relations, and well, it's just not happening here right now. Trump thinks Voltaire is a Harry Potter character, <laughs> so I, I, I don't know how that landed, but, but okay, it seems like the, the Europeans are playing good cop, bad cop with Trump, because they have Macron come in, and they have make-out sessions, and then <laughs> now Merkel is here, who he doesn't like very much. You can, She's a little spicier. You, she, <laughs> um, and she said something really interesting. She said, you know, we can't depend on the United States to be the leader anymore. And I guess that's where the world is. Well, you know, we have actual metrics on this. There was a Pew survey of G20 countries just in the last few days. And what they found is people do trust the United States less than Germany now. Yeah. And why not? What, I mean, what, why do we have to be in that position? That was not something that was thrown down by Thor. Uh, why, why can't it be somebody else's turn? I mean, we, we're not still holding the Germans responsible for you know what, are we? Look, fair, uh, I'm not going to touch the Holocaust stuff tonight. Well, <laughs> However, I'm just saying it was a very long time ago. How, how long did, German, did Germans have to say, we're not those people anymore? I think the problem is not that Germany may be taking the place of the United States in terms of international relations leadership. It's that China is filling the spaces Absolutely. we're leaving behind. So everywhere around the world, we are slashing our diplomatic spending. We do not have ambassadors. We do not have assistant secretaries of state who can actually embed things like this upcoming North Korea meeting yeah. in long-term strategy. And what's happening with China is they are spending more and more on their diplomats in places like Sudan, where once they were this rapacious interloper, didn't give a crap about human rights, stole all the oil, and then got the hell out of there. Now they've got a regional envoy doing shuttle diplomacy, trying to get political settlements in these difficult spots. They've got big, big scale and development they're building projects. All over the world. They're building all over everybody's the world. roads and hospitals and power plants. And there. every kid in every corner of the world right. sees that. I mean, and increasingly, they don't see a U.S. embassy there. Yeah. I mean, Napoleon said, China's a sleeping giant, let her sleep, and they're woke. Speaking of woke, <laughs> they, they are woke as hell right yeah. now. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> But uh, unfortunately, not on human rights or the kind of leadership that I think we all value and hope but is But it seems like our problem is the problem that happens with every empire. First of all, we were never supposed to be an empire. And I don't think we use that word enough. America is an empire, unlike any other country now. We have troops in, you know, over 100 countries, bases all over the world. Um, some, some of these places that we fought in World War II, we still have 40, 50,000 troops. I don't understand why. Um, but whenever you have an empire, the, the thinking tilts toward the military as the people who can solve everything. And it seems that is where diplomacy suffers, is because Americans, they just never stop voting for more money for the military, let the military do everything. We put them on a pedestal, and everything else um, is not what it used to be around the world. It's a vicious cycle. We no longer have diplomatic capacity. We don't have negotiators. We don't have peacemakers. And so people do trust the military more. We do run everything through the, the military. And politicians get on the campaign trail every time, and they denigrate 
I think people who are really brave men and women serving the world everywhere as diplomats. You know, these people get characterized yeah. as dusty bureaucrats. They're not. They are in difficult, dangerous places right alongside our military. No, it's, it's a part of the encroachment that Eisenhower talked about all those years ago. It's the military-industrial complex. It slowly takes over everything. And, you know, uh, one of the things I write about in this book, War on Peace, is I was a, a little guy at the bottom of the totem pole at the State Department in Afghanistan. If you wanted to build a well or reach out to a community in rural Afghanistan, you had to do it through the Pentagon if you wanted it done sure. this year. And that's a real problem, because the Pentagon is thinking tactically. It's not thinking about our long-term strategy, necessarily. Okay, so let's switch subjects to your other big area, which is you wrote the article about Harvey Weinstein. You, it was supposed to go on NBC, right? It was. But it wound up at The New Yorker, it because did. NBC, uh, now they're dealing with a, a story about Tom Brokaw and, and Matt Lauer and... Uh, Gosh, what's in the water over there? Um, uh, and uh, Bill Cosby, it's very fitting you're here right after he gets uh, uh, sentenced, or not sentenced, but found guilty. Um, these were the big fish. These were the really bad people. Do you think there's an excess in the movement that is causing a backlash, that's hurting it? I'm thinking about people like Al Franken, Aziz Ansari, uh, Garrison Keillor. You know, I, I was reading a story about him. And it said, uh, well, he, was, he had a reputation of bullying in the workplace. That could just be somebody's opinion. And then it said, and on several, on one occasion, I thought, oh, here it comes. The penis came out at the Christmas party. <laughs> said, and on one Everyone had this pent-up desire to show their penis that we just didn't talk about for years and years. And... Not, not everyone, but... <laughs> Well, well done. But, but uh, a, a shocking number of people. I don't, right. I don't get the M.O. But it said on one occasion he posted an off-color limerick. And I thought, maybe we've gone too far here. So, so I, I would just point out, I think that our culture has actually been pretty good on the whole about self-regulating. So you mentioned Aziz Ansari. You know, that blog about Aziz Ansari came out. It was clearly a, you know, a single-source narrative about... Uh, a date gone wrong, and there was a debate about how far gone wrong it was, but I don't think anyone saw that and said, oh, he's Harvey Weinstein. This is a multiple rapist. No, I think but he, he lost a lot. Clearly. <laughs> but he's not around anymore. Is, is that true of Aziz Ansari? I think so. I think his... I, I guess I we'd have to ask him how he's doing these days. Well, I think we could find that out. I don't think we have to ask him directly, but I don't think his show is on I anymore. I just think I, that I, that reporting I, was regarded exactly as it should have been. People saw it for what it was. There was a debate about it. There was they? a lot of criticism of it. I think so. There was so. some. I think people I think are so. divided. I think a lot of people are... Yes, you're right. There was backlash, mm -hmm. and I think he... Uh, suffered a lot also from it. And, and I would say that those cautionary tales, I think, have been pretty well received by fellow journalists. Overall, what I've seen is the vast majority of the reporting that's actually broken through has been very meticulous, has referred to very serious crimes. And, you know, this separate discussion of the gray areas and how far it should go, I, I think we're sorting that through just as we should be. Al Franken, you think he should have quit? You know, I didn't do any reporting on the Al Franken story. So I know, I don't but, know but the you could have an opinion. Yeah, it, you know, I, I do think that it's correct to distinguish between these kinds of violations and these kinds of behavior. But I would also just make a point. This whole conversation, Bill, was under wraps for decades. Yeah. There is so much pent-up yeah. anger and heartbreak and lack of accountability that I do think it is understandable that it's coming out in torrents right now. Okay. Well, uh, you're doing amazing work on a number of fronts. You obviously have your, your mother's incredible compassion. And... Uh, She's great. And your father's steely ambition, whoever that may be. <laughs> 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 great to see you, Ronan Farrow. Hey, thank, you. thank you very much. Thanks, everybody. All right.